like to talk about is uh, why Cradle? You know, why another build system, right? Um, can you hear me well, even in the last rows? So um, requirements for build systems have changed tremendously in the last 10, 15 years. I remember when N came out, I was so happy, right? I could, uh, I could finally compile and jar my stuff up and copy some stuff around. That was all I wanted to need, uh, to do, basically. And I finally didn't need my IDE anymore to do that. Right. So that was before test-driven development. That was uh, before agile development. So oh, <laughs> don't tell you how, how old I am. Um, that was uh, uh, definitely way before DevOps. That was definitely way before the whole idea of continuous delivery. Right? And uh, uh, all these advancements in software development uh, put a complete new load on requirements uh, 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 onto the build systems. Right? Uh, uh, building the jar and copying some stuff around and compiling is a tiny fraction of what you need to do when you automate your enterprise. You have a heterogeneous software stack, Scala, JavaScript, mobile applications, C++. And when you want to do full continuous delivery, you, want to, you, you, need, to, you need to homogenize, you need to, you need to standardize on, on, on this heterogeneity. You want to have a, a standard binary dependency management for all these different platforms. Uh, you want to have a standard workflow, a standard staging. That the software often needs to collaborate. Java needs to talk with C++ or vice versa, et cetera, et cetera. You have, uh, uh, you have a software stack that has grown in size. The average software stack is much, grow much bigger, much larger than it has been 10 years ago. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, you have performance issues. Um, uh, feedback, si feedback cycles are often way too long. Um, so um, when you want to do agile development, it's, it's even more important to get that in shape, right? Uh, uh, that means you want to integrate very often. Uh, teams that work across continents want to integrate very often, not as in the old days where everyone was doing a job and then after one year you try to integrate it, right? So uh, the requirements have changed tremendously and out of, out of those requirements, Gradle basically was, was created. The heart of Gradle is uh, uh, doing the heavy lifting right, for, for the requirements of nowadays project automation. And um, one important, important part of that story is, uh, uh, is, the, is the difference between declarative and imperative build systems. Right? What, uh, what does it mean? How does this affect the design of Gradle? I guess you all know an imperative build system in the Java world, which is AND. And you all know a declarative build system, which is Maven. So who of you is using AND mostly for building Java stuff? Who of you is using Maven? Who of you is using Gradle? <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for the AND. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the market share we, we, we used to. Sometimes AND is more than Maven, sometimes the other way around. OK, so um, let's start with some demo uh, of uh, uh, Grail in action to illustrate some of the concepts I will be talking deeper about uh, in, in a couple of minutes. So um, this is the imperative layer of Gradle, right? You, uh, uh, we don't call it targets, we call it tasks. And um, you can start with an empty Gradle build script, right? And create a task, and you can execute it, and it says, hello world. Wow. <laughs> There's more to say about this imperative layer, but uh, you have this this is, this is the low-level layer of Gradle, right? So now, let's say you want to build a Java project, right? Uh, well, you could now do it the end way, compile tasks, create a compile task, a process resources task, a test task, etc. But you have a more declarative way of doing this, right? So here we have a Java project. Production uh, code lives in source main Java, test code lives in source test Java. Some might know this pattern. <laughs> and uh, OK. What can we do? Well, we can tell Gradle, hey, Gradle, this is a Java project. And if we now ask Gradle what we can do with this, oops, we have now a full life cycle of working with a Java project, right? Can you read well in the last row? Otherwise, there are still there are more seats available. OK. But it's not impossible to read. OK. So, uh, you have a full life cycle for dealing with Java project. You can build, you can test, you can compile, you can jar, you can Java doc, et cetera. OK, so let's try this out. Let's try to build this Java project. We have some 
compile error? Well, we need org Apache Commons collection, right? So let's add that. So we tell Gradle, hey, get your repositories, uh, get your dependencies from Maven Central, and um, we declare for compiling, we need Commons collection. Here we go. Run it one more time. Yeah. Another error, another compiler error. What is missing? Well, JUnit, right? So we have to tell, hey, Gradle, uh, for compiling and running the tests, you need JUnit. Good, we add that. Boom, we now build, and everything should be fine. Okay, so, uh, so pretty similar to Maven, right? You just say it's a Java project, declare some dependencies, and you stick to certain conventions, and everything works out of the box. Okay, so uh, if we look now in a build, there is a build directory. The convention is that the jars end up in the libs directory. Well, this jar doesn't have a version number, so let's declare a version for this project, 1.0, and let's re-execute the build. And here we go. There is now a Java standard 1.0.jar. Okay, now let's add some requirements. The requirement we want to add is uh, we have integration tests we want to run as part of this project, right? And those integration tests have specific external dependencies that, are only, that only apply to the integration tests like XML unit, okay? So how would you solve that requirement with Maven? I want to run integration tests with specific external dependencies Within the same project, I compile my production code and I run my unit tests. Maven build masters, provide your solutions. Right, so you would, you would write your own integration test plugin? No. So the recommendation, as a, the recommendation would be create another sub project, right? Basically, uh, the, the Maven way is that you don't have your integration tests in this project. The Maven way is create another sub-project for the integration test. That works, right? It's just not the way you wanted to do it. Okay, the tool wins, the framework wins another time, right? But <laughs> can be done that way. How would you do this with AND? Pretty easy. Just copy, yeah, sorry, yeah, please. With, with N and Ivy. Oh, yeah, with N and Ivy, you could easily solve this. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's my point. With N, you would just copy uh, another Java target, another copy target for copying the resources, and, uh, uh, and then a test target that executes it. With Ivy, you could deal with the external dependency management and would easily solve this problem. Not very declarative, right? But you could easily solve it, which is good. The absolute quality of end, right? It hardly locks you in until things become unmaintainable. <laughs> but that's, yeah. <laughs> but that depends a lot also on the skills, of course, of the end build masters. So Carl definitely wouldn't accept the attribute unmaintainable <laughs> for the Netflix build, for good reasons, I'm sure. So, uh, okay, how can you do this with Gradle? Well, you could do it the end way, right? You could say, uh, I create a compile a task, and et cetera, et cetera. But can you, can you solve it declaratively? So here we have the integration tests, right? Source integration test Java. So uh, let's, let's tell it to Gradle. Hey, Gradle, I have sources. I give them the name integ integration tests. They live in source integration test Java, and the resources live in source integration tests resources. Okay. And if you now look at the tasks, you see there is an integ test classes task. You did, right? I could have declared it directly, all those tasks, but I have here a declarative element, source set integ test, and by declaring I have sources by telling Gradle the what, I automatically get the how. What can I do with those? I automatically get an integ test classes task that compiles those. Make sense? Without explicitly 
declaring these tasks. So that, that's the, so it's a declarative way of saying I have additional sources, right? Let's, um, let's execute this intake test classes task. Oops, again, compile error after compile error. Okay, a couple of stuff is missing. JUnit is missing. Ah, or Cradle person is missing, which is part of the production code. Well, in my integration test, I usually need my production classes to do the integration test, right? Another thing that is missing is org XML unit, which I, which I need. So let's tell Gradle, hey, for compiling those guys, I need the output of the main source set. The Java plugin is adding two source sets with the name main and test. One represents the production code, the other represents the unit test. And I can access them. I can, I can ask them, hey, main source set, give me your output. And this output should be part of the compile class bar, right, for the integration tests, OK? Now, what do I do with the uh, external dependencies? Well, I declare an additional scope, right, a dependency configuration, how we call it. I call it intact test. And I tell it, this intact test dependency container should contain all the dependencies of the test runtime uh, container, which has all the dependencies of test compile, et cetera, et cetera. Those ones here, compile, test compile, test runtime, they are added by the Java plugin, and I can further add dependency containers, right? So, and now I add an dep actual dependency to this intake test dependency container, and then I can tell Gradle, hey, the compile class pass for the integration tests should have all the dependencies assigned to intake test. Right? Okay. So, uh, now let's compile the whole thing and let's see if that works. Yes, successfully compiled. Okay, let's continue. Let's execute the tests, right? So we, crea we create an integration test task, specify the test classes there, source sets, intake, output, classes there, and the class pass for running the tests where we say the runtime class pass of the intake test, we haven't defined it yet, we define it, Runtime class path is the output, which is the output of this intake test object, the compiled integration test, plus its compiled class path, right? That's what you need for running the integration tests. Okay. Oops. Ah. So we run them, and everything should be fine. Well, not strictly. So where we are, okay, let's first see that they are, that they are really have been executed. Our nice test reporting and uh, person integration test has been executed, right? Plus person test, which was a unit test. So one thing we haven't done yet. The Java plugin defined a particular life cycle for a Java project. This integration test task is not part of that life cycle yet. You have to execute it explicitly, but if you tell Cradle, build the whole project, integration tests won't be executed. So the Java plugin adds a check task as a lifecycle task to a Java project, and all the code quality related tasks hook into this check task. So the check task depends on the JUnit task. They depend, if you add them, on a check style task, on a find bug task, you get the idea. And now we tell the check task, hey, you also depend on the integration test task. Boom, we can now tell Gradle, build the whole thing, and Everything is built, including that the integration tests are executed. So, so you took basically the standard lifecycle for a Cradle Java project and extended it with your own requirements, right? OK. So now, this, pers this Java project is not a Java library. It is a Java application. It has a, it has a class, person, that has a main method, right? So you want to. You want to be able to uh, do something with this application. You want to build a distribution with uh, start scripts, and you want, to, um, you want to be able to run it from the build script to see if everything is OK. So how could you do that? Well, I already told you how to do that. Again, two ways. You could do it the end way, create a run task that, 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 that calls the main method, create a dist. A zip task that builds the distribution, etc. But you can tell Cradle, hey, this is not a Jar normal Java library. This is an application. The application name is Super App. The main class name is Org Cradle Person. Okay, so and you see now 
By adding this, you now have an additional ins this zip task, an install app task, and a run task. Let's call the run task. The run task compiles everything and executes th the main method, the application, basically, right? Uh, the install app task builds the application. And you can see there's now an install directory with a super app directory, which has a bin directory with the start scripts and a lib directory with the, needed, with the necessary dependencies. Right? So, and it is extremely easy to extend Cradle, to extract the specifics of your company into, into a plugin and to share it with the rest of the world. So the application plugin is, is an example how we extend the Java plugin uh, uh, in, in the Cradle core distribution. But you could easily extract stuff with Cradle. So I create a Cradle directory here. I create a file called integration test Cradle. And I now go to my build script and cut out all the stuff I've added for dealing with the integration tests. And now I go into my project and say, hey, apply the integration test plugin. So, and that way, you have defined now your own extended standard. This, is, this could now be your enterprise plugin, applied to, any, to all the projects in your company. And there is now the notion of integration tests being part of your normal Java story, right? And uh, going back um, to, yeah, how could you do this with Maven, right? It, the, norm, the answer would be create another sub-project, which works. But uh, that's not the way I want to, how I want to model that. In Gradle, we have integration tests that are, that are testing the whole distribution. They should live in a separate sub-project. But we also have integration tests. We have 30 or 40 components, right? Which are component-specific, which, which only test the IDE aspects. And those integration tests, they belong to this project. I don't want to have a tool that tells me, no, they must live somewhere else, this code. I said, no, I want to live it there. That's where, they, that's where the code belongs. Now, uh, uh, if we would follow this pattern, well, that, that we would have to create for every component a component dash integration test project. We wouldn't have in Eclipse now 40 projects, we would have 80 projects. At one point, that's a scalability thing. The refresh in Eclipse is not your best friend, right? right. So, uh, so we think it's extremely important that you're able uh, to model the stuff exactly how you want, where you, how you want to have it, right? So declarative, yes. Rigid, no. Only when you want to be rigid with your developers, you can tell the story with Gradle, but the build system shouldn't be rigid with the build masters of the world. They know their domain better than the build masters. We provide standards. If they suit you, use them, but you must be able to extend them and to tell your own story. And now we come, basic, it's, it's, this lies at the heart of Gradle. There is a fantastic interview a couple of years ago between Erich Gamma, the Gang of Four, Erich Gamma, and Bill Venners on atima.com. And uh, Erich talks about uh, the dangers of doing frameworks, big frameworks, uh, right? And, uh, and he's saying the danger with big frameworks is at the beginning, it's fun. You get all the functionality for free. But once you have a requirement that is, that is unanticipated by the framework, you start to fight with the framework, well, and you start to lose 100%, right? This was the case with EJB2 Container Managed Persistent. Who has survived this? Yeah, oh, geez. And this is the case with some build systems, which also have survived. Uh, so, um, so what is our answer to that? So at the heart of Gradle is a build language, right? A toolkit, because that's Erich Gamma's recommendation. Build toolkits and optional smaller frameworks on top of this toolkit, right? A toolkit that has no opinion with some frameworks that have an opinion. Because the Gradle Java plugin is a little framework. It has, a, it has an opinion. It has the opinion the production code lives in the same project as the unit test code. 
So the guys from LinkedIn have a different opinion. They have separate projects for production code and unit test code. So, and for good reason. The, the one reason is they want to have clear class paths in Eclipse. Eclipse doesn't have any class path scope, right? So, uh, so how would, they, how would they deal with that? Well, if Gradle were just a framework, we could say, well, just apply the Java plugin. Then your production code project has a test task, well, but it doesn't really hurt. And your test project has some production code compilation step. It doesn't really hurt. Well, just go ahead. Somehow, somehow it will do the job, right? And then, and then you hire a new person, right? And uh, this person works on a production code, runs the test. Hey, tests are successful. Well, there are no tests, right, in the production code. So he commits the stuff, stuff is broken. So then you decide, hey, every new developer must get his build system briefing, telling him all the pathologies, all the stuff that is weird, that shouldn't be as it is, but he has to be aware of. No, no, no. That's not how you should model your production domain, and that's not how you should model your uh, uh, build domain. The same principles of, you know, of good design you apply to your production code, you should apply to modeling your build domain. And in, in fact, uh, uh, there are a couple of smells. If you read the refactoring book, uh, for, you, can, you can transfer uh, to the build domain. Forcing someone to create a sub-project just for a couple of classes, right? That, that, that's for me a lazy project smell corresponding to the lazy class smell of the, you have in your production code, right? Unnecessary abstractions, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's, you could give a whole talk on that topic. So, okay, but what is the Gradle solution, right? Uh, it's, the solution is, hey, don't use our opinionated little Java framework, right? But don't go back to Adam and Eve to the lowest layer and now use the Gradle task to uh, do everything on the low level, use the build language. You have, you have very, a very rich language to describe a Java project, right? Source sets, et cetera. This is a domain-specific language for telling your, your story for Java projects, right? So, and with this, it would be very easy to tell the story what, what a LinkedIn Java project is. So integration test is also an opinionated plugin. One integration test per project. It might be exactly what you want, for your company, but maybe you have a couple of teams that are saying, hold on, sometimes we have multiple sets of integration tests per project, right? With different external libraries. Now you could tell, tell them, oh, then create another sub-project, <laughs> right? No, that wouldn't be the solution. The solution would be extensible. You can create your own language elements. You could easily, I don't have the time to show that, uh, like, like there is a source sets element to declare sources, you could add an integration test element where people could just use it, integration test, tell the source directory, and everything would be set up. A task to compile them, a task to run them, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be the solution, right? You might have an opinionated framework, but you also provide a language element for people that need more flexibility. But for, the, but for them, it will be very easy. They don't need to do much copy and pasting. They say exactly what they need, integration tests. And that's the whole purpose of, of writing DSLs. We come across a lot nowadays uh, of companies who are now using Scala, preferably, for creating DSLs for domain experts. Domain experts in the financial industries, domain experts in the biotech industry, et cetera, et cetera. Right? They, don't, they don't want to know anything about Scala. They want their experts in their domain. The same is true for build systems. Software developers shouldn't be experts in build systems. They are experts in what they want to do with their software projects. And you should provide them a language where they can easily describe their requirements and not have wiki pages after wiki pages, how they have to deal with that. So this is, this is uh, 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 when you can read this in the last, in the last row, you get this book. <laughs> but what build system is that? And well, for some reason, well, we can, you, you, you can realize what it is. So um, this is a build system uh, from a company called Automated Logic. They do, they do building automation. Pretty complex stuff, big building automation, right? So uh, not home, not home, not private homes. And uh, they have 100 plus developers and uh, also 100 plus submodules. And um, 
they have a pretty complex uh, matrix. Uh, depending on the building type and the customer type, they must assemble distributions, right, which are specifically configured. So these distributions take a subset of their, of their components, configure them in a specific way, burn everything on a CD, or whatever, now a USB stick, whatever, and ship it to the building, right? Very high QA requirements. There's no way to easily uh, uh, have a hotfix, right? And, and a domain which is pretty sensitive. You don't want to screw up the, the, the climate, the, 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 what do you say? Anyway, know what I mean. <laughs> so uh, climate control. So what you see here was necessary for a normal developer to add another submodule. This was a lot of copy and paste. And those were all different property files they had to touch and extend to add their, their new module to the end build framework. And those were smart guys. But they pushed end to the limits. Right? Right? They wanted to have some, something that models their domain, but they couldn't hide the complexity. So this was extremely error prone. And developers were completely, they hated it. Right? They at one point boycotted it. They said, we don't add any other submodules. Fix this. We don't deal with this anymore. So uh, their pain was so high. This, this is a critical, this, this is their software stack, right? Their pain was so high that they switched to Gradle when Gradle was 0.5.2, our first big enterprise build, right? So, uh, and the, one of the things they loved was that they could create a DSL for their guys. So now a software developer doesn't need to do anything with AND. They, they're not even aware necessarily that they're using Gradle. Let's say, hey, for, the pr for this product, we, use, we need the subcomponents. We have some dependencies. For the doc, uh, we have this documentation text. Requires license and, and specify a launcher. This is a specification. This is a story that makes sense to you with the little background I, I've given you, right, for that they're building some kind of, of, of application and distribution. This big progress, right? OK. So one thing that Maven really added to the domain was the idea of standardization. Right. Absolutely. And uh, standardization based on opinionated frameworks with a build-by-convention approach. And they did that long before it was hyped with something like Ruby on Rails. So I really give them credit to come up with such a mechanism very, very early. And, uh, and, and many people love Maven because uh, uh, it took them out of their and nightmarish, completely non-standardized built environments, right? So, and, and we, for us, standardization is, is a very important aspect, spe specifically for, for larger shops. And, um, but the main point for us is not that Gradle provides some out-of-the-box standards for you, like this is a Java project. This is nice to have, right? But the real value add for companies, for us, is that Gradle is a standardization toolkit that allows you to define your own standards for all the stuff that, are, that, are, that doesn't come out of the box with the build system. And I, I guarantee you, there is a lot. I mean, if I look at the Gradle build, what we have to standardize and, uh, uh, and do for our automation, which is on a la not so large scale than, than any significant uh, enterprise build, uh, we think this is, this, is, this is very important, that it's easy for you to standardize the stuff and, and deploy those rules across the whole companies. How to do this, we will learn later. So another thing, so even if you don't care about standardization, if you say, hey, I'm from a pretty small shop, we don't have many teams, right? We just want to have a good build system. Um, Cradle is not a Java build system where you might be able to squeeze building other platforms somehow into it, right? It's extremely open and flexible for any platform, right? Java, Android, C++, JavaScript, etc. cetera. And um, we are very excited that we are working together now with the Google Android team to make Cradle the next default build system for building Android apps and Android libraries. So that's, that's great news for everyone, I think, <laughs> but also for us, uh, well, at least for, for the Android world. And uh, because they, they, there are some issues with building Android apps, right? And, uh, uh, and the, Android, the Android SDK 
people, what they did before they were thinking about tools, they were writing a build spec. What should a build system for Android should be able to do? And they created a terminology like product flavors and build types. And they could take this spec, or we together took this spec and extended the Gradle build language to capture that. You can say, hey, Android, I have this product flavors, a free version and a paid version. You can specify that. And, and under the hood, you get all the complex logic out of that. Android is pretty complex, you know, with all the emulators and the specific testing requirements. This, yeah, you can specify it, the what and the how is done for you. And it integrates deeply with the, with the existing Gradle build language. So when you specify a free product flavor, a, a, a free source set gets automatically created, which you then can further configure, et cetera, et cetera. So even if you don't care about standardization, the fact that Gradle is extremely open uh, uh, will, will make it a, a, a first, how do you say, a, a, a tool of choice for you know, modeling any domain, right? And so, uh, and give you a very good experience whatever, whatever software stack you're using. Yeah. One interesting thing about uh, declarative elements, they are queryable. I mean, it's very hard to query an end build. Ask, ask an end build for anything. Hey, what are your source directories? What are your test directories? Right? You might have some conventions, but you couldn't ask the build. You could have some heuristics or whatever. And having declarative elements, you, can, you now have, uh, have an object graph. You can say, hey, give me all the product flavors that are free and whatever over all my software stack. Oops. So uh, that was the declarative layer. But at one but you also, well, at one point, the what is one thing, but as the build master, you also have to define the how somewhere, right? What sh how should things be done? So Gradle also has a very rich imperative layer. So in that respect, we think Gradle is also the better end, so on, on the low level. And I will show you some examples why we think this is the case. So task dependency inference. Okay, let's take this example from the integration test, and now let's add the requirement, hey, I want a jar task that uh, uh, jars up my compiled unit tests, for whatever reason, I want to have that. Okay, I tell Gradle, hey, test source set, give me your output, and you specify a naming pattern, and uh, what's going on here? And you now can execute this test jar task. And what is kind of interesting is the classes are compiled, the test classes are compiled, and then the jar is built. Did we tell this to Gradle? Right? No, we didn't. The only thing we specified was uh, that it should use, come on, that it should use uh, uh, the test output. And this output object is a rich object that knows a lot. Not just that it's not just a string that represents a path, right? So, um, see, here's the Java standard test 1.0. Um, in Cradle, the output objects know what needs to be done to create the content. So the test output object represents the directory of the compiled unit test classes, but it also knows that it needs to compile tasks to create the content of this directory. So you encapsulate that in an object. It's reasonable object-oriented design. Compare this with end. You have a property with the name classes there, right? And then you have a, a target compiled tests, which pushes the stuff into classes there, then you have a test target, which depends on compile test, and needs the classes there, you have a test jar target, which depends on compile test, and just the classes there. Now, let's assume the rules, how you create the binaries of the unit tests are changing. Let's say you don't compile them anymore, right? Let's say you must get them from some zip, zip file in some binary repository, right? Could be. With end, you have to go to all your build scripts and, and change the depends relation, right? You have to say everywhere, don't depend on compile test, now depend on uh, extract zip file, right? 
you have to repeat yourself. You say, you need the classes there. And by the way, classes there depend on compile test. Use the right? And so you have to specify this rule over and over again. When you change it, you have to change it over, over and over again. In Gradle, you can specify a classes to a property as a rich object and tell this property, hey, you need this task to create your output. And then you just tell Gradle, hey, you need this output property, and the wiring of the tasks happens automatically. Right? So just one maintainability advantage, right? Another thing, smart exclusion. I mean, this is a build master tool. Let's say I want to build A. It depends on B. B takes usually 15 minutes, some document generation. And now you're debugging something in A. You want to, you want, you're working with it. You want to execute it. You, know, you have to execute it five times a minute. And now B always takes so long. Oh. So what do you do in end? Pardon me? Well, yeah, but you, you might not want to touch the build. It would be a way. Another way, you might also don't want to touch the build. You could introduce skip properties, unless. Right. OK, I mean, better than nothing, right? So, but you have to say it explicitly. I want, I want to define this property to skip this task. But then, let's say B depends on C and D. You also have to say, oh, damn. I also have to define the same skip property for C and for D. So you told and already B depends on C and D. And now with the skip properties, you tell the same story another time. right? With Gradle, you don't need to do anything. I mean, skipping is just a built-in feature. And when you, when you execute A and skip B, the task C and D will also be skipped, because B depends on them if none of the tasks that are executed depend on them. It's simple, but hey, hey it's, it's it's, it's cool. And I mean, other build systems don't even have the notion of, of skipping, right? You depend on the mercy of their plugins, whether they are skippable or not. And that's for a build master a pain in the ass. I mean, when I have to do, execute something over and over again, always have to wait. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, wow. so hey, one of the highlights. See how we're oh, doing fine in time. Incremental build. Who is always doing a clean when the end build is executed? When the Maven build is executed? Oh, a lot of brave people out here. So who is not doing, who is usually not doing a clean? In the end of Maven, if you don't do a clean, it doesn't give you that much performance advantage. The Java doc is still generated. The tests are still executed. The, uh, uh, the jars are still created. The only thing that Java only recompiles the uh, Java files that have been touched. <laughs> but only those, not the ones this file depends on. So you have a pretty unreliable compile. So you, you take quite a bit of risk for not getting much out of it. So therefore, most, therefore I got used to always do a clean, right? Uh, I mean, are you using at you build the end checksum task to make things faster? Check. Yeah, end has some some stuff where you, can, where, you can, where you can check whether output input has changed or so. Ah. Yeah, OK, understood. So OK, let's see how Gradle behaves here. So we have another normal Java project. Um, now let's do a clean build only once, <laughs> just to start from scratch. Now let's do a normal build and a non-clean build, boom, everything is up to date, right? Very fast. So now let's change the production code. Let's remove this field, name two, and let's rebuild again. Aha. This was picked up by Gradle, right? So. Um, uh, everything was recompiled, the bytecode has changed, so the jar was uh, rebuilt, uh, so the class pass had changed for the test, they need to be recompiled and re-executed. OK. So this up to date here means there are no resources to process, so th that therefore this is always up to date, but the other stuff needed to be re-executed. OK. 
Uh, by the way, compile Java and process resources are aggregated by the classes task. So this is an aggregator task. When you say, hey, I want all my binaries, this task depends on compile Java and process resources to do the two steps that are necessary to create the binaries. OK, now let's do something else. Let's remove a comment. Right? Let's re-execute the build. And ah, that's, that's interesting. It was recompiled, right? But the bytecode hasn't changed. So the JAR is up to date, tests don't need to be recompiled, etc. OK, let's do something else. Let's change the source compatibility layer, which is not a file. It's a property of the build, right? Will this be detected? Yes. And of course, the bytecode changes, so everything needs to be redone, right? JAR needs to be rebuilt, etc. Let's change the version of the JUnit dependency for compiling the test. Will that be detected? I hope so. <laughs> yes, tests are recompiled. The rest is up to date, but tests are recompiled and re executed. Now, let's. Now, so far, we only changed the input. Now, let's change the output of the previous run, right? Let's remove one of the compiled production classes. Let's re execute the build. And boom, recompiled, but the bytecode was up to date, so the rest is up to date. OK. So, um, OK. So the interesting question is now um, this is kind of the, def this is the behavior of the default Gradle task. How can you use incremental build of Gradle for your own custom build logic, right? Can you use it? So we have here a mountains XML file. And the requirement is for each node of this XML file, for each mountain node, we want to create a text file where the name of the text file is the name of the mountain and the head of the, the, head, of, where the, uh, and the head of the mountain is the content of the text file. So let's just do some groovy stuff we don't need to care about here. I create a task generate mountain files with some groovy XML parsing that generates those text files, right? So let's execute this task. Isn't that cool? GMF. You can use camel case task execution on a command line, and Gradle will find the correct task. So the big question is now, okay, no, no, first I want to show you that the task did what it was supposed to do. Yeah, let's refresh the Eclipse workspace. You have a mountains directory, a K2 text, and yeah, a Mount Everest text. Okay, requirement. Solved. Now let's go back and re execute the task. Will it be up to date? W what is your trust in Gradle? Uh, come all the way from Germany to show you some crappy up to date shaking? No, of course. <laughs> of course it's up to date. It's not up to date. Let's try it again. OK, up to date check for custom build code is part of the commercial Gradle offerings. No. No. <laughs> it's not. Let's revisit. This guy here is not my friend for various reasons. First of all, I mean, analyzing what the, what, what the input and output, oops, I don't want to, do, analyzing what the input and output of this, uh, uh, of this scripting implicit code is would be very hard, right? The other thing is, I talked about declarative build scripts, right? And in Gradle, we always try to separate the declarative from the imperative, right? The build script, the normal build script should be spec-like. So now we have this, uh, the scripting code in there. You can easily imagine if this is getting out of hand, you have, you have completely messy, non-declarative, hard to read build scripts. So this is something I don't like. So what can we do to improve that? We can create a custom task. We call it convert mountain XML. And uh, we say, hey, the input file, the mountains XML file is a property of this task. The separator, feed, column, number, and the output directory where the text files are generated. Then we have a task action. The action that is actually executed by this task, right? And um, 
And now let's get rid of this guy here and make it more declarative. Say this task is of type convert mountain XML. The output dir is build dir mountains. The input file is uh, source mountains XML. And the separator is a column. Hey, this is much nicer, right? Now let's re execute. Okay, we generated. Now let's re execute with other clean. Hey, everything is up to date. Free and open source for you. <laughs> Um, so now let's let's see if it's if it's really working. Here we go, K2 text and Mount Everest text. Okay, so let's change the mountains XML. The numbers are anyhow crap, but let's change them to another crap number. And uh, you see, no longer up to date. We generated. If you execute again, up to date. One more, one more uh, thing to try out. If we change the separator which is a, real, a property of the task, not a file, to a semicolon. Uh, we execute. It's picked up this change. And you see, yes, please reload. We now have a semicolon. Right. And the, what is really cool here, I think, you didn't need to tell Gradle anything about incremental build. We just, Gradle just provides you a way to describe the input and output of your tasks. And this very powerful functionality of an incremental build, you get for free. And this is so simple. You can go home now. You understood all you need to do. And you now have incremental build. But there is more you get out of that. Let's, let's uh, specify an XML file that doesn't exist. Well, we know it's an input. And you now get a nice error reporting. You don't need your own checking. If file doesn't exist, make a nice error message. You get that for free. Another thing that is pretty cool is uh, you can now say Gradle clean generate mountain files. So for every task you have, you get a clean task that only deletes the output of that task. Another sharp tool for the build master. Let's say something is corrupted, but you have a build, build output that is pretty expensive to create. You can very sharply say, only create the output of this guy. And how can we do that? Well. You told us what are the output doors of that task, right? So it's pretty easy. And you see it's, it's deleted. And another thing is you don't need to do a make dir. Well, we, we, we Gradle automatically creates all the, out, all the files that are declared as output directory before the task is executed. Little stuff. A lot of goodness we can derive because you, you, are, you can describe the input and output of tasks. So let's restart it. OK. So next topic. Expect the unexpected. Expect Clint Eastwood talking to empty chairs. That's what I. <laughs> 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 um, so the build domain is a complex domain. There are many requirements. I'm always surprised to hear them, right? And uh, uh, so many requirements are out there we, I would never anticipate as a build system. So somehow you have to write a build system basic, and, and any software for a very complex and unknown domain in a way that it embraces the unknown. Not in a way, oh, unknown, keep out of here, right? Uh, this is the way to do things, right? And uh, that's, that's another thing that is at the heart of Gradle. So... Uh, just, we just look at an example. We have uh, another, another Java project. And uh, this Java project has quite a bit of spring-related code. Right? So, and we want to create separate jars for our spring code that relates to the SpringDB layer, for our spring code that relates to the core layer, etc. The default jar is added by the Java plugin. By default, it contains all the binaries. We tell it, hey, don't include our Spring-related code, right? And then we have a SpringDB jar, as said, um, a Spring Core jar, and a Spring Messaging jar. So one thing you can now easily do with Gradle, you can tell Gradle, hey, uh, 
build, use the assemble task, which is a dynamic task, run it, and it, it builds all the archives you have declared. Right? It's a, it, it checks what, what, uh, uh, what archives are there, and it builds them all. OK. So and you see, built by convention, there's a libs directory, and here we go. You see the naming pattern in place. The appendix is springdb. So the name is the name of the project, rules, springdb-10.jar. OK. That was the prelim preliminary. Now, I don't know if you've heard that. Uh, Spring Source has changed their license agreement. The, license, the new license agreement says um, that every jar that has the name Spring in its name must contain a picture of Rod Johnson in the MetaInf directory of that jar. Can you believe that? So here's the picture of Rod. It's a goodbye present to Rod, I think. <laughs> so here we go. Now, Ant build masters of the world. How do you solve that with Ant? Right. You could say, OK, we don't use the default jars of Ant anymore in this enterprise. We have our own macro dev. And every jar must use this macro dev, which then does something like that. OK. Maven, extend the assembly plugin. OK, how can you do it with Gradle? Oops, damn. Sorry, wrong button. OK, here we go. OK, in Gradle, we can say, hey, Gradle, for all ties, tasks of type jar, which are matching a certain pattern, jar archive name contains spring, for all those jars, add the picture of rod to the meta -inf directory. So is this pseudocode or is it real? Too good to be true, right? Uh, so let's execute. Gradle assemble. OK, one cool thing, jar is up to date. We haven't changed it. But the other jars have picked up. Oh, the meta -inf probably has changed, hopefully. Let's see. Let's see what's in the zip. In the jar, I mean. Here we go. Faster video. You see, rod JPEG. And to be sure, we look at the standard jar, no rod JPEG. OK. Hey, problem solved, right? Now, QA is extremely concerned. The fees are very high for violating this new agreement. And they want to do you know, checks now and then, whether those jar really have the picture. On the other hand, there are some really big builds out there where the jar takes 30 minutes to be built with all the documentation generation. So they're saying, hey, guys, give me a task that only builds the spring jars. I'm not, I have I, I, better things to do than to wait 30 minutes for a jar to be built that I don't need. Right? OK, how can you do that? Well, just do a little refactoring, extract variable, all spring jars. You have an object model, right? Task is, a, is of type task container with type jar returns another filter jar container, matching returns another filter jar container. Hey, you know, this is a rich object model. So this guy here represents a filter task container. Now let's apply the rule. All, all tasks in this filter task container should, have this should, uh, 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 should contain a picture. And then use this filter task container to create a task spring jars that depends on the filter task container, a one-liner. Now, you just say, hey, Gradle spring jars, camel case execution, boom, only the spring jars are built. OK. Now let's add a little bit, because it's fun. Uh, the next requirement, you, need to create, you want to create some checksum files for the jars to better track them, right? So you can add behavior to those spring jars that you say, hey, for every jar, create a checksum task. Does Gradle have a checksum task? Yes, because Ant has a checksum task. And Gradle ships with Ant. Ant is part of the Gradle distribution. So everything that is an Ant is your friend. So we executing 
the spring jars, and you see, build, lips, here we go, checksum is there. OK, now, oh. the next thing is, in a bit, a little bit, the next requirement, I mean, this is now only part of this project, but you want to apply this stuff to all your projects uh, in the enterprise, right? So, oops, sorry. So the first thing we need to do, the first thing we need to do is, at the moment, the picture is, um, is part of the, of the source tree of this project. So we want to use a picture of rod that is in a repository and can be retrieved from every project. So how do we do that? Well, we declare a repository, a Maven repository somewhere, repo at gradle.org, gradle demo. Then we create a custom dependency configuration and add the image that is in this repository, com, my comp, spring, rod, 1.0, JPEG, as a dependency. Like you can add a jar as a dependency, you can also add a JPEG as a dependency. That would work with Maven or with Gradle or with Ivy, that you can do that, right? Uh, so, and then in the from section of the meta inf, we just say from configuration spring. Boom, we now retrieve the image from, from rod from a remote repository, and uh, um, that's the first step to be able to share this logic across projects, right? You see, rod 1.0 JPEG. Now, the next thing we want to do is to share this. How can we do that? Well, let's cut this guy out. Let's go to GitHub. It's my GitHub repository. I have a couple of plugins there. And there is a spring.cradle file, which I already put there. It's exactly the same code I just cut out of my build script, right? Exactly the same code. So I now uh, take the raw URL. See, this is, this is just the URL to this file. Copy it. And say apply from, boom. This is a remote Gradle script, a Gradle plugin. And say clean spring jars and unzip. Rod's picture is there. Now every project in your enterprise can use that. It gets even more interesting later when we show you how we can auto-apply such plugins, that the developers don't even need to apply them explicitly. OK. So before you tweet, SpringSource has changed the license agreement. They haven't, <laughs> as you can imagine. But the set of requirements, that's the typical thing that happens to you for, when, you, when you need to do automation. This is not a bizarre requirement. I've, I've seen more bizarre requirements. I've seen requirements like this unit test, this one unit test only uh, fails always when you run it the first time, when you run it the second time. And when it then fails, it fails. When it, then su when it succeeds, it succeeds. And there's nothing those guys could do about it because it was a complex test. The infrastructure team was involved. They didn't want to do the changes to fix it. So there are always situations you have to deal with. And it doesn't help you if there is a tool that says, well, it shouldn't be like this. Well, bloody hell, I know that it shouldn't be like this, but it is like this. And it is not in my power to change that. So should I disable the test? Is that better? Of course not. So you need, and this is a, when I came across this requirement, I mean, I haven't thought about this, or we, when we were creating Gradle, but in Gradle, you can hook into the, into the, test, into the test runner. You could, you could deal with this requirement. And then the other thing is, if you have such a pathological requirement even, and you would ask us, could you please, in the next release of Gradle, add a method, uh, fail only uh, after so and so many runs? You would say, <laughs> no, 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 no. Our API stays lean. This, this crap, no, we don't. If you are a big framework, the only thing you can do to accommodate the pathologies of the world is to blow up your API because people can ex can't, can't extend it, right? So you have to wait for the next release, and then yeah, either they, they, they screw up the API to help you or not. So, but I would say, hey, use the Creator Toolkit to express that. You could even, just as a side note, 
extend the Gradle test task easily to say, hey, test task, I add another property, fail after so many runs, just for your enterprise build infrastructure. You can extend even the API of the Gradle task, but please, that will never be part of the public API of the Gradle distribution. But you can model that. So, multi-module builds. Multi-project builds, I should decide on the terminology. So, um, here we have a root directory, it's called multi-project, and we have three components, API, shared, web service. So three terms we have now, component, module, project. Yeah, I always, uh, I don't know. I, one day I have to decide which one I should use, but anyhow. <laughs> so uh, how can you, and they, they have dependencies between each other, how can you model this with Gradle? Well, the first thing you do is to say, hey, I create a settings.gradle file, and I tell Cradle, those are the components, the subcomponents that take part of this single build. API, shared, and web service. Okay. So you can now ask Cradle, hey, show me the projects. And, oops, sorry. And you get such a report. You got the project structure can even be nested. It can, have, it can have multiple hierarchies. Okay, that was the first step we need to do. The next thing, we create a build script in the root project, in multi-project, and tell, tell Cradle what is common between all the components. So for all the components, we say they are Java projects. All the components should get their repositories from Maven Central, and all the components should use JUnit for A2 for compiling and running the tests. And all the components are version 1.0. Okay, good. Now, the shared component doesn't have a build script on its own. It just, you, it's just happy with the, with the stuff that is uh, 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 defined in the, in the root project. So we go to shared, and we can now say, hey, Gradle, build shared, and shared is built. OK, boom. So API is our next candidate. OK, shared one o jar. API is different. We need, a we need a build script for API because API has uh, uh, dependencies that need to be defined, right? So the first thing, API depends on shared. It needs the output of shared for compiling. So in Gradle, we have a specific notations for saying this is a project dependency. This is a dependency to another component versus an external dependency, right? And it also needs comments lang for compiling. Okay, let's go to API. And let's run the build. And what is interesting now is that Gradle automatically built shared before it built API, right? So, which is, yeah, pretty cool. When you have a larger code base and you're debugging uh, your application, you, you often don't know in which components you're, 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 you're changing stuff, etc. And then when you then run the build to figure out if everything is working, you don't want to manually uh, uh, rebuild the components you have changed, but you also don't want to do a full build because it takes too long, right? So, okay. Shared is not fully built. It's not tested, right? It's only, only the jar is produced. API is fully built. Okay. Now, let's deal with web service. Web service also needs to have a build script on its own because it's a, it's a war project. It extends the Java project, and it has also dependencies, um, comments collection, Commons.io and a dependency on API. So let's build web service. That's what we call a partial build. And you see, first shared is built, then API is built, and then web service is fully built. Okay. So let's go to API. So, and the question is, if you did a change to API as a developer, and you, you build API, the tests are running, etc., cetera, um, are you good enough for committing the code? Why not? Exactly. So, I would like to know. So I tell Gradle, 
build API and build, de de build all the dependent components as well. And you see, API is fully built and tested, and now web service is fully built and tested. Web service cons is consuming API, right? Now you're good to commit. This partial build that only builds a subgraph of the components plus incremental build is a dramatic time saver to get the average build time down. You could even say, hey, <laughs> build the components of API that depend on API and also build fully the components that is, are needed by API. So shared is now also built and tested. Okay, uh, the last thing I would like to show with multi-project builds is um, you can, of course, go to the root project and build everything. And that's what we're doing together with the dash dash profile option. Cradle creates a profile report that shows you uh, the performance characteristics of that build, right? Total build time, startup time, how long it took to configure the build, how long dependency resolution took for the, for the different scopes, and how long the task execution took. That's, so we take performance very seriously. So you could even do stuff like, here we said, this is common for all sub-projects. Now we can do something what we call filtered injection. We can specify the stuff that is only common for libraries, for example. In this case, for API and for shared. And then we defend, de define, hey, libraries are all the sub-projects that don't have the name web in its site. You can use whatever filter you want, right? That don't start with web. And that way you can define in your root build all the stuff that is common for all the components, the stuff that is common for the libraries, that is common for the web project, that is common for the documentation projects, etc. So very fine-grained way of injecting things. Not a single inheritance-based model, right? You can do some other cool stuff. You see here all those build.gradles. Damn, what build.gradle is what build.gradle? You have now multiple components. So you could easily tell Gradle, hey Gradle, I want to have a different naming pattern for all my subcomponents. The build file name should be the, should be the project name .gradle. Even this is something you can configure. And then you just rename the build.gradle of web service to web service.gradle. We should have made this the default behavior of Gradle, but now backwards compatibility wise we can't change it, but it's easy for you to, to do this to do this. Right. Okay. Oh, and you can import easily such a multi-module build into Eclipse. We go we go to our multi see the multi-project build. We tell Eclipse build a model. We tell now Eclipse import everything. We could even specify tasks that should be that should be run before and after the import. And we say finish. And uh, everything is now imported into Eclipse. Select working set, multi project, boom. Here we go. And there is now a Cradle dependency container in Eclipse, and uh, the source folders are correctly configured, etc. Okay. Now we're coming to one to the to the highlight. I have still a little bit of time left. Build master's delight. What do we mean by that? Mm. The Cradle wrapper is one of those pieces we we really like. Let's demo this to you. So we have here a normal Java project, and we created the build master would create a task called wrapper. Nothing else, just task wrapper, type wrapper. And if the build master then executes this task, the following is happening. If you look here, this task creates a cradle W, a cradle WBAT, and in a Cradle directory, it creates a wrapper directory with Cradle wrapper jar and Cradle wrapper properties. And this is the Cradle wrapper properties file. So, those four files, you would commit to version control. The next time one of your developers updates from version control, the developer can build with Gradle. 
even if Gradle is not installed on the machine. The developer would just say Gradle W instead of Gradle, and then does all what he wants to do with Gradle. And then the wrapper would go to this distribution URL and download this specific version of Gradle and installs it to the machine of the developer. If you upgrade to a new version of Gradle two weeks later, you just change the wrapper properties file with the new, new URL, commit it to version control. People, next time people do an update from version control, they use the, the new version of Gradle. Extremely convenient for developers, one aspect. The other thing is historical builds, compliance. You now have in version control the build system that is needed to build this software, right? It's nailed down. So, and no longer support issues like it doesn't build with my version of Gradle. You say, well, interesting, use the wrapper, right? So, um, okay, next power feature in its scripts. It's our la last section. So, let's say in all your projects, you have the requirement that the repository should be retrieved from Maven Central. So we have here a normal Java project. We cut this out, that the, that the dependencies are retrieved from Maven Central. And we just take some init script, and we say all projects, repositories, Maven Central. This is some script somewhere on your machine, right? So you now can go to this build. testing with Gradle, right, where we just remove the repository declaration, and you can say, hey, Gradle, build this guy, but inject this init script into the build. And it works, right? The repositories are retrieved from Maven Central. Everything is fine, although it was not specified in the build of the testing with Gradle project. Now, let's do some cooler stuff. Gradle has a very deep API. You can hook into every aspect of the build lifecycle. So, for example, what about a warning when the tests are taking long, when a test method takes longer than 20 milliseconds to run? Would be cool. So the Gradle object here is available in an init script. It represents the Gradle runtime, and we now tell the Gradle build runtime, hey, Gradle, after all your build build projects, components are evaluated, right? Do the following. Give me the root project, and now access all projects in this, in this build, and for all tasks of type test, right? Cre hook in a test listener, calculate the time it took to run the tests, check whether it was too long, and then issue a warning with the name of the test. OK. Now let's re-execute testing with Gradle with this init script. And you see you now have those warnings. Now you don't always want to specify an init script, right? So what can you do to make it common behavior? You take this, you take, you go to the Gradle distribution, and every Gradle distribution has an init.d directory. You create now a script in this init.d directory, my init.gradle, whatever, however you call it. Paste this code. Go back to the command line. Now you don't need to specify the init script anymore. Run the tests, and you see the warnings are printed. So, and now the full story is the following. You take a Gradle distribution as the build master at the stuff you want to auto-apply to all of your projects in the init.d directory, and then you point the wrapper properties to this distribution, right? In the wrapper properties file, you can point to your enterprise Gradle distribution with the init.d directory 
with your enterprise customizations. Does it make sense? And then all your developers will have this behavior, including the picture of Ron, Rod Johnson in a MetaInf directory. Right? Pardon me? Exactly. It's completely transparent. They don't have to read a wiki how to set up my local build system. So, and this is a really deep API. I mean, it's one thing to define a repository. It's another thing to hook into the test, into the Gradle JVM that is running the test and get events back and do something with them. Of course, you can also use init scripts and say, hey, this init script is all only for CI. So stuff you only wanted to do on CI, you can tell the CI, hey, use this init script. That is not happening on local builds. For example, the init script could check, uh, and now we, we're back to the build language. Hey, Cradle build, give me all your repositories. Did you dare to declare your own repositories in the project build and not use the company repository? No, 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 build fail, right? You want to allow that on a local build because people want to try out stuff, but maybe not on the CI build, right? So, uh, yeah, you can go, yeah, it's, it's, Gradle is deep, you can go, you can go into the guts of Gradle to, to model your requirements. So, the other thing you can do is, in, in a project directory, in, in one of your projects, you can, you can, or in any of your projects, you can put a Gradle.properties file, right? And you can specify certain properties. Let's not talk about the daemon right now. You can specify the Java home, that should be used to run the build, and you can specify the JVM arcs that should be used by the JVM that is executing the build. Again, no build wiki that is saying, please set your end opts or cradle opts to that value, which is anyhow then global for all the projects. You can lock this down. It's version controlled. It's, his, it's historical. It might change over time. Right. So, so that means when cradle runs, it checks, is the JVM arcs property set? If it is set, it fires up another JVM that then executes the build, right? And if you use the daemon, then, then things are much more efficient because Gradle then has a long-running JVM that is warmed up and is much more responsive. So, so, so uh, then Gradle just checks, do we have already a daemon JVM with those JVM arcs setting? Well, then reuse it, right? Okay. So, I'm running out of time, so uh, yeah, Gradle has very good end integration. You can reuse any end task, right, with Gradle. You can even import end builds into Gradle, and Gradle wraps the end targets at runtime. You can inject properties into end builds from Gradle. So with end, we have a very deep integration. With Maven, we integrate very well on a repository level. So Gradle is able to generate POMs, right, to publish uh, artifacts with the POM, to, to Maven repositories, uh, or Maven under, uh, Cradle understands POM, understands Maven snapshots on a dependency level. Maven is two things. Maven is a build system, and Maven is also a, a protocol for dependency management. On a protocol of, for dependency management level, we are fully compatible with Maven, right? So if different components, different teams interact in a company via a Maven repository, they, the other team won't notice whether you're using Gradle or Maven. We are working on, also on, a way to import Maven builds, to convert Maven builds to Cradle. So in 1.3, which is, should be out in, in four weeks or so, you should see a first, a first conversion plugin. That's. Migration is a very interesting topic, build migration. It's, uh, it's mission critical, right? I mean, for many builds. So you want to, you want to do this in a very safe way. And uh, what we usually recommend is, <laughs> Use a build system that doesn't force you to tear apart the existing input structure. If you have a build system that says, well, what this end build is using, I can't reproduce. You have to completely change your source structure. Well, this is an end build 100 people are using every day. And this is, this is, this is, code, that is constantly, code that is constantly developed. So what do they say? Well, then you have to branch, I suppose. Well, I suppose you have to branch then, correct. So then every day, have fun with the syncing of the different repositories. Have fun with comparing the results. Never do build migration like that. Uh, and 
<laughs> if you have the choice, choose a tool that doesn't force you to do it like that. So what we usually recommend is don't touch the existing input structure until the, the, the end tool, for example, uh, as long as it's, as it's live. Add a Gradle build that consumes the same input structure. And Gradle is extremely flexible. So we had companies that were using .glassbus files from Eclipse as their master dependency metadata. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't give them a book for that. <laughs> but uh, I told them, don't change it right now. You know, we want to have, comp we want to, we want to be able to compare results, right? So we wrote an adapter that translated the .class pass file into the Gradle dependency notation. And then we, we, we started to build up the functionality of the end build with Gradle. And for every relevant output of the build, the archives, the Java docs, the tests that are run, we wrote Gradle tasks that compared, are the archives exactly the same that are produced by the Gradle build compared to the end build? Are the same tests are run? Is Java doc the same? I couldn't imagine to do any significant build migration without such tests. It's a nightmare. And I've seen people suffering heavily from doing build migrations without such a safety net. Right? I, I would never do that. Because what is the same tomorrow might be not, uh, today might be not the same tomorrow, right? This, this, is, this is code under development. This is a moving target. So you want to have always the possibility to say, is my Gradle build doing the same? And if it's not long, any longer doing the same, you have to figure out why. At one point, the Gradle build is, uh, uh, is capable of reproducing all the functionality. The tests are running. And then you can say, OK, I, sw I switch. Right now, the Gradle build is my production build. And then you can start to say, OK, <laughs> maybe finally it's time for the class pass to be derived metadata and no longer master metadata, et cetera, et cetera. But test-driven test build migration is, is the way to go. A little bit background information. So Gradle is a, is a very active project, right? We have a vibrant community um, and um, ve very proud of our community. Um, yeah, I think we have a very, very, very nice team of developers. So the, the founder of the Mojito testing framework is part of the Gradle team, the author of the, the Spock framework, one of the founders of Selenium. So yeah, very they the Gradle core committers and, and, and part of Gradleware. Uh, we release frequently. With the milestones, people didn't realize that we <laughs> release frequently. But now, since 1.0, every six weeks, there has been a new Gradle version. 1.2, uh, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 will be out there in, in a couple of, or in four weeks. So uh, we practice what we preach with continuous delivery. And, and we are able to do this because we are highly automated. We have a one-click release, and we have a pretty complex release process, right? And we have 8,000 unit tests to guarantee the quality. So that's, uh, um, yeah, so uh, uh, many significant projects have switched to Gradle. You know, the first one was Hibernate a couple of years ago, and Spring Source has, has completely switched, and uh, almost completely, and uh, Many enterprises are using Gradle in production for quite a while, even before 1.0 was out. So, uh, so and it's getting it's getting more and more. There's a there's a there's a strong momentum going on, um, and uh, which, which is important when you when you choose such a such an infrastructure technology, right? You want to be sure that uh, that it that it will be around also in five years, right? So, uh, there's a company behind Gradle called Gradleware which provides uh, support subscription, you know, all the professional service model, training, on-site co consulting, remote consulting, um, uh, prioritized open source development, custom development, et cetera, delivered by Gradle core developers. So um, yeah, that's it for tonight. Thank you for your attention.